Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to give you a glimpse into what Patagonia's social responsibility journey has been. Um, and at the heart of any social responsibility journey, Patagonia or yours, there are two very important key components. Number one, workers. Hundreds, thousands of workers that make our products and they are the reason why we're here as brands and suppliers. And the second one is commitment. Commitment from brands and suppliers to improve workers' lives. So let's keep that in mind as we move to, uh, through this presentation. Um, and we've heard the word journey all throughout uh, this afternoon. Um, and that's very important because um, in any uh, program, sustainability, respons social responsibility, or environmental responsibility, it takes many steps to get to where we want to go. Uh, and I want to point you to this picture because this is our first factory floor, Patagonia. And if I uh, went to audit that factory 46 years ago, uh, this is Yvonne Chouinard here with the S in the middle. Um, they used to make pitons for the climbing industry. So if I had walked into that work floor as an auditor, um, I would have probably failed them. <laughs> and so uh, that shows you uh, where we've started. It's been a series of steps for us as well. Um, I wanted to go back and get us all on the same page uh, as to what I mean when I talk about uh, supply chain. And Derek touched a little bit on this earlier. Um, but this is kind of the utopia, right? Our consumers uh, really think, okay, you have fabric, you have a make, uh, cut and sew, and then you have a product, and beautiful, it's done. This is not really what we're talking about. This is a utopia, but it's beautiful. Um, this is really what we're dealing with. <laughs> and uh, how many of you work in supply chain, uh, you can attest to this. Um, and the importance of this visual is uh, to know that in any of our programs, partnership with our suppliers is extremely important. Transparency from our suppliers is extremely important. And for us brands to know exactly what is happening at each of those bubbles, it's very important to make the change. So keep this in mind as we move forward. So where did this all start? Uh, Derek touched on uh, the FLA earlier uh, in the mid-90s. So we were founding members of the Fair Labor Association, and that's sort of the cornerstone of our social responsibility program. Um, and the FLA sets really high level, high bar standards um, for different brands to start their social responsibility journey. From those standards, we create our supplier code of conduct. Um, and this code of conduct for us, we translated into at least 16 languages for all of our factories because of the importance of communicating your requirements. Um, I mean, I can't overstate that importance. If, think about if you didn't have your spec sheet for your products, for your quality products, you couldn't make the product that you wanted. This is the same thing for human rights and health and safety and, and everything that your code of conduct has. So for us, we cover um, high level, human rights, health and safety, environment, traceability, and animal welfare as well. And for each of these, then we have what we call a benchmark document and separate standards that detail more uh, as to what we want our suppliers to do. So the code of conduct is external to our suppliers, but we also use it internally. Uh, and so how do we do it at Patagonia? How do we make sure that we bring suppliers that are like-minded and that follow our philosophy? We have a process that is called the fourfold process. And this is where our social environmental responsibility works together with our sourcing team, works together with our quality team, and we together decide who uh, meets all of our requirements to come into our supply chain. So if the business, for instance, needs uh, a new t-shirt maker, they have to make a special request to the fourfold saying there's, there's this, there are these reasons why we cannot put this t-shirt in a current factory. We evaluate them um, and then we decide. And the beauty of this process is that each of those groups have equal veto power. That's very powerful because my team can go to sourcing 
and say, you know what, I know this is a product, this is the only factory in the world that can make it, I know that the price is right, I know that the quality is right, but they don't meet our requirements for social responsibility. Or Enviro can say the same thing. And we have to go back to the drawing board. And if the business really needs that factory, then we say, okay, we gotta make really difficult business decisions because we have to either move production to a later time to allow the factory to get to where they want to be. We have to look at what the issues are at the factory and decide, do we need to invest as a brand to get the factory to the level that we want them to be? And so th those discussions happen and we need to decide the level of partnership that we need to engage with our factory. Um, so this is very, very important. Uh, as an SER, as a social environmental responsibility department, we could not do anything if we don't speak in one, uh, with one voice with our business team and our quality team and our sourcing team. It's so important for all of us to speak in one voice. So some of the tools uh, that we use to um, evaluate our suppliers, these are a few. Uh, for social responsibility. So first, uh, we do audits and assessments. And audits, I know they have a bad reputation, <laughs> but uh, audits are very necessary because you take the temperature, you take the pulse of the supplier and see where they are in their own journey towards human rights and environmental responsibility and health and safety. And, and they're just learning our requirements, right? Patagonia requirements are very, are very difficult, so we have to understand uh, where they are in that, in that uh, spectrum. So audits, very important. Then we go into a root cause analysis of the issues. Say we find fire extinguishers, uh, issues with fire extinguishers, uh, fire safety. We don't just want the factory to hang the fire extinguishers. We want to know why the fire extinguisher wasn't hanged. We want to know, was there a program? Is there anyone involved? What happened? Um, because that's what's going to help us, help the supplier fix that problem for good, not just the Band-Aid, not just to check the box. So checking the box is something that you don't want to hear at Patagonia. So uh, root cause analysis is very, very important. And we have a team, I have a team of uh, five people overseas that work hand in hand with our factories, not only uh, sometimes doing the assessments, but also uh, walking through the root cause analysis and helping our suppliers understand that we don't expect perfection, that we understand. I mean, we have our own mistakes, and, and uh, we've heard it before. I think as brands, it's important to um, talk about the fact that we're not perfect, and we don't expect perfection, but what we do expect is transparency, and we do expect uh, um, a willingness to improve and a willingness to work with us to get to where we need them to be. So commitment. Um, the third uh, tool we use is capacity building. So it's not only enough to find the root cause of the problem, but then how do they fix it, right? If it's an issue that they don't have expertise for, we can't just leave and say, figure it out. Maybe they don't even know who to call to, to figure out that problem. So capacity building, we have experts in-house, uh, we do trainings, we do education. If we can't help them in-house, we figure out who in the region, who in the country can help come in, um, uh, fix those problems for our supplier. So these three tools um, are very important, and it's important to note that only audits will not solve the problem. Audits are just a, uh, a thermometer. You can't just solve the problem by doing audits. Root cause analysis, that's not enough. Training, you can do training until the cows come home, but alone is not enough. So it's important to look at all those three tools together to the extent that you can. Um, and so a few years back <laughs> when uh, with um, the Outdoor Industry Association, we created uh, a responsibility to toolkit for, for our industry and uh, where we outlined uh, the foundational elements of a compliance program, the intermediate elements of a compliance program, and the advanced elements of a compliance program. So what I just um, mentioned earlier illustrates the first, the basics. So code of conduct, transparency, mapping your supply chain, working with sourcing, uh, using audits and education. So all of uh, the first part um, 
uh, was covered with some of the examples I gave you. The other part, you should have it, I don't know if, uh, did you guys send it in a booklet or maybe you'll get it after the, after, no, okay, so you're gonna get an email with a booklet that has very detailed information on what happens at each of those levels and a lot of detailed advice that is super helpful. It was, uh, I think it was Columbia, REI, Patagonia, several of us got together and we just put it in paper, all the stuff that we did. Um, from when we were just, uh, you mentioned we, when you started, it was just two people. Same for me. Like when I started at Patagonia, it was Kara Chacon, who's the VP of our department, and myself. There were just two of us. So it's really hard when you don't have uh, the manpower to do all this work. Um, and there are simple solutions, there are simple practices that you, can, um, that you can get from this manual. So I encourage you to read it. So next, what I want to talk to you about is a leadership program, and that is uh, Fair Trade. And this is a program that is very dear to my heart um, because we started working on it, uh, Karen and I started working on it when I started at Patagonia. And it took us a long time, but, uh, but we made it. And so, and, and this is considered a leadership program because it doesn't only take care of the basic part of like code of conduct and the audits and the compliance and the remediation, but it also looks at how we as brands can channel financial help, money, to the workers directly without going through the factory. It's just directly to a worker's account. And that is very powerful because usually it's the factory that pays the worker. This program gives brands the opportunity to channel and help the workers directly. And these are workers that are earning minimum wages, maybe a little bit more than minimum wages, but any financial help, it's huge, right? So uh, premiums, um, and the third thing that this program does, it has this, um, what, what Fairtrade calls it, the invisible benefits, right? And the invisible benefits that come from empowering workers to manage hundreds and thousands of dollars that go to an account that they, that they manage and they decide what to spend on it, what projects they want to do. So let me tell you a little bit of, of how that works. So this is a premium model. So we have a Garmin price for Patagonia, uh, and we pay a premium on the FOV of the garment. Uh, and that premium goes into a fair trade worker's account. So it's an account that is not managed by the factory, not opened by the factory. It's the worker. So the worker committee owns the account. And then they decide they, by voting, by a uh, democratic uh, decision, what they're going to spend the money on. So it can be on scholarships for their kids to go to college, to school, high school, or it can be on health insurance or community projects. Um, we've seen just amazing, amazing stories in here. And the power here is that the workers get to manage their own money, their own account. One more thing I want to mention here on this program is that after uh, the factory is certified, um, our, pro our, our garments can have a logo, and that logo is a clear way to communicate with your customers what, that, what buying that garment means. It has been super powerful for us to open up the conversation of labor and workers and the hands behind the product, because as consumers, I think we tend to forget uh, who makes our products, right? We see a t-shirt, nobody thinks that there, there are hundreds of workers in India or in any other country making that product. And this has been a great way for us to start that conversation with our, with our customers. So when we started this program, Karen and I, it took us a couple of years to work internally and get sourcing and finance and the CFOs and everyone aligned as to what this program will mean and how we will do it. And so, um, and so we said, you know what? Let's just start with one factory. Let's see how it goes. Let's start small. So we started with one factory, and it was like a 1% of our product. And then we kept growing, and we went to nine factories. And this kept growing, and it just caught on like fire. And now we're about uh, 31 factories, and it's about 69% of our products that are fair trade. And the impact of that, it's indescribable. When you walk into those factories and you see those workers and they know that they're making a Patagonia product and they know that that product is going to bring a premium that is going to go and help 
uh, whatever project is there, they're, um, they're working on. It is very powerful. So, um, yeah, I want to, uh, five minutes, okay. So in these five minutes, I want to talk to you about a factory maybe some of you are working with uh, in this industry. It's called Shaco. Uh, they make wetsuits. We have the first fair trade wetsuits. Um, and they're, yeah, <laughs> we, uh, they are in, uh, in Thailand. They got certified last year, 2,300 production employees. So think about 2,300 production employees. They got together, they elected a committee, and they got together to unanimously decide what they're going to use their money on. That is so powerful. 75% of those workers are women, mothers, women like us. Um, a third of them are immigrants from Myanmar. Uh, there's a lot of immigrant immigration into Thailand from Myanmar. And it, with this, uh, this year, the, the workers decided, besides shopping vouchers, which is a very popular uh, project they decide to go, because it saves them on supermarket goods and all that, um, they decided to use the money to help uh, the Burmese workers with translators. So think if you put yourself in the shoes of a foreign migrant worker, you don't speak the language, you have to go talk to your teachers, the, the, your kids' teachers, and you can't communicate. And so this is the, this is the, the premium uh, was used to help those workers. And the beauty in this is that of all those 2,300 workers, only a portion of them benefited from this, the translators. And that was okay for everyone. They, were, they, saw the, and they saw the need of their uh, colleague, and they decided, you know what? We're going to help them with this. And you know, that, that is just incredible for us to see. So that is the, the, invisible, uh, the invisible thing that I was talking about. You can't put a price on that. You can't put an ROI on that. Everybody asks us, what's the, what's the return on investment? Have you had more sales? And yeah, I mean, we've had sales. We're growing as a brand, you know, but... I mean, is it from the recycle piece? Is it from fair trade piece? We know that our consumer, our customers love fair trade because they feel connected. And um, so I can't emphasize enough the power of this program and the power that we can all make. We talked about this. We can all make as, a, as an industry. And I'll leave you with this. This is Yvonne Chenard, who you saw in the earlier slide. Um, and Simple saying, to do good, you actually have to do something. And so through all these years, those are all the little somethings that we've done to get to where we are. And uh, please, if you're in Shaco, uh, come see me. <laughs> Thank you.